and I was just carrying out my day as normal and I started hyperventilating. I sat down to take a break and next thing I couldn't catch my breath. And I was like, okay, this is, I, I didn't know what a panic attack was. So I was like, I think my, I'm having a heart attack. I was like, Eugene, you're, you're 27 years old, can't be a heart attack. And uh, I finally got my breath. I didn't want anyone to see me because that negative self-narrative was telling me that if someone sees this as a weakness, they're going to flag it, they're going to tell a manager, you're no longer going to be capable for your role, you're going to be told to take a step back, your job is going to be up for grabs by some high energy intern. And even though that wasn't the case, I, I mean, I'm working with these people for years, of course, they were going to want to help me, they're going to be so considerate, and they would want to be there to support me. But that was just the narrative that I had given myself. That was the reframe that I had given myself. Are you suffering from burnout? Have you experienced it in the past? It's a hot topic in the modern workplace. We only need to look at some of the headlines to learn that burnout is on the rise. In fact, I've just Googled burnout headlines now while I was saying that. Here's some of the top results. Um, so we've got burnout is an occupational phenomenon according to the International Classification of Diseases in the World Health Organization. It comes up a lot in the NHS and healthcare, where thousands of workers are facing burnout at, as we speak. Last year, the Trades Union Congress in the UK said that people were at increased risk of burnout due to more demanding work days. And there's a lot of theories on the causes of this and whether it's possible to end burnout. A lot of people say it isn't. There's some high profile names as well who question whether it's even really a problem. And it is hard to say whether this rise in burnout is because it's a genuinely growing problem, because it's simply better understood and defined and therefore easier to spot, easier to diagnose, if you like. Or it's just the latest fashionable topic for business coaches and authors and article writers. Either way, what is clear is that there are people in workplaces the world over who are suffering with burnout and related problems like anxiety and stress. Perhaps this is nothing new. However, that doesn't mean we should ignore it. So in that spirit, for today and indeed for the next three weeks, we'll be speaking with burnout, stress and anxiety experts to learn more about what these challenges look like why they seem more prevalent today than even just five years ago, what we can do to recover or prevent them, and what the role of the leader should be within that process. And we're going to kick that off with the first expert guest on this subject, burnout recovery coach Eugene Lee. Longtime followers of mine may recognise his name since I was a guest myself on Eugene's own podcast, Give Yourself Some Leeway last year and for the first time this is going to be a two-parter episode so in the first half this week we're going to hear all about eugene's own experiences with burnout how that led him to becoming a burnout recovery coach starting his podcast and making a few other quite sizable career and life changes as well we'll talk about recovery from or prevention of burnout and what we can do as leaders to spot the signs and then act to support our people through that, or if it's ourselves, get through it ourselves. We'll also start to get a bit into the wider leadership implications and the lessons that Eugene's taken about that from his career so far. And then in part two next week, we will pick up that conversation and get into the real depth of modern leadership principles like valuing your people, how transformative empathy, support and training can be, and of course, ending with our Leadership Heroes segment. So plenty to cover there. And I think you can see why this is split into a two-part episode. We were enjoying that conversation so much. It was honestly hard to stop. And because it was all such valuable stuff, I didn't want to cut anything out. So the only option really was to cut the whole thing in half and do it over two weeks. So there we go. Wish I could say I planned it, but I didn't. Anyway, I hope it's useful. I hope you get loads from it. And as always, don't forget to hit those links in the description to learn more. Do get in touch with Eugene, especially if you're going through burnout or you know someone who is. And of course, come and join us at the Integrity Leaders online community.
welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Eugene, welcome to Leading with Integrity. It's lovely to have you on the show. Really pleased that I finally managed to get you on here after being on your podcast last year and really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Again, that's the way things go around here. It's like you, you jump on the podcast and you're like, okay, where do I fit in the schedule now? And then it's, it, as well, being coaches, you always have to set your own boundaries also and things get in the way, but it's about getting there eventually. It's like something like, oh, we couldn't manage it last September. Let's push it to Christmas. Oh, we couldn't manage it Christmas. Forget about it. It's like, no, no. It's like everyone has busy schedules. We can fit in some time. It's just like, this, this is a long process. This is a long relationship as, as coaches. So, so thank you for having me on your podcast this summer. <laughs> Well, as I say, it's great to have you. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's the one of the curses of the modern world, isn't it? It's how quickly we fill our calendars. But, but anyway, it's all come together at last. So let's kick off by really, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, introduce yourself to the listeners. Tell everyone a bit about your background, your career so far, and what you do today. Yeah, so I'm Eugene Lee. I'm a burnout recovery coach. And it all started because I had to, you know, scratch my own itch. I've had to recover from burnout. And that stemmed back, it's only in hindsight. Hindsight is twenty twenty. when you can try and figure out where did it all begin. And I brought it back as far as my childhood with many things that come as self-sabotaging and conditioning in our behaviours as adults. It goes back to our childhood. And a lot of people bring a lot of blame around that. It's like, oh, it's because of how my parents raised me. But... You have to think about that as like, you can't just blame your parents for everything because when they're raising you, that's, they're raising you based on their life experience. That was something that they were taught and they were like, oh, this is how you raise kids or they're winging it. It's only when you're like in your twenties and thirties, you're like, oh yeah, this was like the age that my parents had me as a kid. I'm not ready to have kids or I don't know how to raise kids yet. No one's giving me a rule book. So they only taught us how they knew best. And for me, growing up on a dairy farm in Cork in Ireland and being part of a family of five kids, they're going to put you to work as much as possible. It's a hard work ethic. And what the thing was, like, as much as that hard work ethic served me later on in life in terms of work and studies, that I was disciplined, I was like, no, you just have to work through these things. There was a niggling negative self-narrative that came along with that. And that was that... If you have time to preoccupy yourself with X, you are not spending enough time on Y. So if you're busy enough that you're stressing out about your your studies or your math exam or your English test, then you're not focusing enough on the work that needs to be done on the farm. So they throw you up in the farm and they'll find work for you to do. And if you immerse yourself in that work, you don't have to worry about all your other things in life. And that gave me the self-narrative that if you have time to be alone with your thoughts and worry about what's going on in your head, then you're idle, you're lazy, you're a failure, and you're not, you're not confident enough at what you do, that you're, you're going to be left behind. And I took that narrative into everything in life. So whenever there was trauma or sickness or anything that was going to hold me back, I immersed myself in work. I immersed myself in my studies. I immersed myself in my first full-time job. And Along with that came uh, kind of, I had to hold up this veil that I was this high energy, high spirited person. Even when my energy levels were low, I had to come across as being high energy, hard working. Because if I ever dropped that facade, I would be seen as weak or incompetent and no longer a good fit for this role. And trying to maintain that mask, that facade, it takes its toll over time. Because if I feel weak or incompetent because I'm overwhelmed or stressed, it's like, oh, well, I'm no longer going to fit into this career. Someone's going to just knock me off and I'm going to be replaced by another high energy student or intern coming in, just going to take my job. And that's how we're made feel also. And so I had that, I was like, how can I maintain this high level of high energy all the time? Because I was working four to five, 12 hour shifts a week and it's not possible to maintain that level of energy all the time. So I needed to compensate. And that's when things come in like caffeine and sugar. Um, there was a time when I had normalized having 20 cans of Monster in the backseat of my car. 
And people were like, that's crazy. Why do you have so much monster in the back? And I was like, oh, it's, it's part of my job. I need to have this here so that I can have energy so I can do my work. And people were like, no, that's crazy. And I'm like, oh, it's, it's normal. I've been doing it for years. And that should be a big red flag. That should be alarm dots. But for me, it was like, oh, I normalized it. It got to a point where I was dry scooping pre-workout um, in between like a 12-hour shift to get me through the day. And next thing I got to a point where I was like, the caffeine no longer has an effect. It's just become a habit, a very unhealthy habit. And I'm consuming all of this caffeine and completely desensitized to it. It just became a routine. And when it came to my burnout, the ultimate rock bottom was about five years into my career. And I was just carrying out my day as normal. And I started hyperventilating. I sat down to take a break. And next thing I couldn't catch my breath. And I was like, okay, this is, I, I didn't know what a panic attack was. So I was like, I think my, I'm having a heart attack. I was like, Eugene, you're, you're 27 years old. Can't be a heart attack. And uh, I finally got my breath. I didn't want anyone to see me because that n- negative self-narrative was telling me that if someone sees this as a weakness, they're going to flag it. Tell a manager, you're no longer going to be capable for your role. You're going to be told to take a step back. Your job is going to be up for grabs by some high energy intern. And even though that wasn't the case, I mean, I've working with these people for years. Of course, they were going to want to help me. They're going to be so considerate and they would want to be there to support me. But that was just a narrative that I had given myself. That was a reframe that I had given myself. And so I went and I, I, looked, I was like, look, I need to go get help. Went to the doctor. They prescribed me with four weeks off work. I was like, hell no. I've, I've, I've never taken that much time off work. I, I, I just don't do that. And that was the thing. It was like, okay, um, I need to take some time off work so that I can recover from this. And I had no experience about how do you deal with burnout? My manager said, take time off work, recharge. You'll be back to normal in four weeks. But I had no idea. How do you recover from burnout? I was, was it rest? Was it yoga? I don't know. It's just a trial and error. And after four weeks, of course, I did not recover. It, well, I was still went back into the burnout cycle and went back to the same old behaviors. It took me about three and a half years to actually realize what was holding me back. Why was I repeating the same cycle, all the self-sabotaging behaviors? And how do I overcome those? And that took a lot of self-reflection, self-work, kind of getting your self-awareness, talking to myself more kindly, self-compassion. And putting together a self-care routine that actually benefited me. Because sometimes people think that they are doing self-care activities, but it's actually harming them more than healing them. Wow. Okay. First of all, the 20 cans of Monster. I'm glad you finished that story with in your car as opposed to drinking a day. Because that's where I thought it was going. I was like, what? No, it, it wasn't in a day, but some days it was like, uh, like drinking a glass of water, I would go out and I'd be like, oh yeah, and maybe four or five cans a day. And next thing I realized, I was like, this is, this is normal and it's expensive. And even though I justified by buying it in bulk, I was like, okay, I'm buying it for maybe like one euro a can. And I was like, I'm saving money here. It's like, what if I didn't drink five cans a day? And one of the hacks that I did to kind of wean myself off that much monster was I drink half a can and then I'd fill up the rest of the can with water. And then I drink it diluted. And next thing I drink it another bit and I dilute it again. And it got to a point where I was keeping a can of Monster in my fridge, but it was only water in the can. So it was just a habit of drinking out of a can. And next thing I was like, okay, I'm no longer actually looking for the Monster. I'm just going through the motions of drink, drinking water out of a Monster can. And next thing I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not looking for the caffeine here anymore. It was just a routine. So I was able to wean myself off how much caffeine I actually drink and how do I want to take in my caffeine? Do I want to get it in an energy drink? Do I want to get it in my tea? Do I want to get it in my coffee? Yeah, I must confess, it's always been coffee for me. That's that's my my main and yeah, it's probably my only addiction these days. But I yeah, I, I find it very difficult to give that up. Why I think this point is interesting, though, is burnout as a, as a concept. I think most people think of it as a, a mental issue, right? But there are also physical issues that it causes like addiction to caffeine and energy drinks for example and then the negative health effects that follow on from that particularly if you're having five a day or more i wouldn't yeah shudder to think what (laughs) what that might have been doing to your insides but it's one of those often overlooked aspects isn't it of burnout as a whole 
because it's not just about, oh, I'm, I'm a bit fed up at work today. It's much more than that. And I think it's a very easy, particularly for some of those more predatory bosses, shall we say, to just kind of brush it off and say, no, you just have a day off and you'll be fine again on Wednesday or whatever. Yeah, and because there are no physical symptoms, people don't validate that it's a valid excuse to take time off work. Because uh, I always bring back, um, it's, it's funny, I had gone through my whole burnout recovery and the next thing I sprained my ankle at work. And then they're like, oh, did you trip over something? It was like, was it something in the environment? What actually happened was it was repetitive strain over years of uh, doing the same task, but not actually taking the strain off my ankle. And next thing, it, ligament, or the tendons, ligaments all tore or whatever. And next thing it was like, okay, I actually, actually can't put weight on that foot anymore. And next thing I was in crutches and they were like, oh, you're, you're not allowed into this environment if you're on crutches. So you're going to have to do, sit at the desk and work from there from there until you're off the crutches. And I was unconscious for maybe two weeks. Next thing I was like, it's okay. I can, I'm trying to get back to normal. And I no longer was carrying the crutches around, but I need to keep on taking weight off my foot. But because I no longer had the crutches, they were like, oh, you're off the crutches. So I had to go up to the seventh floor, up the stairs. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I've, I've sprained my ankle. And they were like, no, but you, you don't have crutches. How, how, how can you prove you've sprained your ankle? There's no physical, or there's no way we can see that you have sprained your ankle. And so I had to go around and I put a, an extra bandage just around outside my outside my jeans, just around my leg, and I, I'm kind of like dressing up like a mummy. I just I, I just had to over exaggerate that I can't put weight on this leg because it's covered in bandages, and that was the only way that they were alerted to. Okay, there's there's an issue here, and we don't want to over exacerbate that issue that's already there because we can see the signs. Whereas when it came to my burnout, a lot of people don't want to even talk about it. I mean, it's, it, it's a taboo subject. If someone says, oh, I'm feeling a bit stressed or I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed, they're like, well, get over it. You know, how do you, how do you think I feel? As a manager or as a leader, how do you think I feel? I'm, I'm dealing with a lot more stress than you are right now. I've got a lot more on my plate, so get over it. Every, this is the way everyone is around here. And rather than validating people's feelings, there's like, well, it's easy for you to say, and rather than actually understand where is this person coming from, and because of that, because people feel that they cannot speak up about their mental health, that they're put down or may feel weak or incompetent, then they don't look for help either, or they don't. They, they try to again overcompensate. That if they're feeling stressed out, they're like, "Well, I'm going to have to work twice as hard so that they don't think that I'm falling behind." Yeah, there's uh, it reminds me of the old uh, cliche or metaphor: the judging a book by its cover. And having to <laughs> that story about putting the bandage around the outside, that's I mean, that's mad, isn't it? That is, that is just actually madness. <laughs> yeah, it was it was so funny. And I was like, and and that was just, it was only when I was going through it, I was like, okay, it's only because I'm exacerbating or over exaggerating the fact that there's the injury there. I, I still couldn't put weight on it, bandage or not, but they only took it into consideration if they could see, oh, that looks like an injury. Whereas if you're, if, if, if you don't, let's say, people always downplay their mental health or if they're, if they're, over, if they're exhausted, they'll say, oh, it's nothing. I've been dealing with this for years. Oh, it's, it's, it's nothing. This is the way things have always been. And then people just take that as, oh, they're used to it. They know how to deal with it. Let's give them more work so they don't have to, so, so they can feel normalized rather than saying like, how about you take a break? How about you do a, a, a little, you know, um, a little less strenuous task so that you can give that a break so that we can do a big task later. Yeah, I think it's quite a good metaphor, isn't it, for burnout itself, is there's the no visible signs of injury kind of thing. It's an interesting one around the whole sick leave question as well. And I think, you know, big corporations have a occasionally quite a bad reputation for this sort of thing. But that story you were telling about the manager's response reminded me of in a small business setting exactly that. It's like, well, okay, I understand you're feeling a bit overwhelmed and maybe you're experiencing burnout, but, you know, we're a small business. There's only 10 of us. Everyone's going through that. So what do you want me to do about it? And that kind of is exactly what you said. It's almost refusing to validate it and then getting into that sort of one-upmanship about who's having the worst time. And, and none of it is helpful. And it's, I think, particularly with mental health challenges like burnout, it's it just makes it all so much worse, doesn't it? If people would just have a, like a, an empathetic human-to-human -human conversation about this sort of stuff, 
And I do think that is the responsibility of leadership, bringing it back to leading, because I have to, it's my thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I always keep on bringing things back to burnout, and especially burnout in leadership. Uh, but again, it's I, I, that, it's that one upmanship, as you've said, that people are, it's rather than validating the feeling and saying like, oh, I, I feel what you're going through. And uh, I don't know what it's like for you, but this works for me if you want to try this. And rather, rather than meeting someone at that level and saying like, oh, I understand you're feeling exhausted right now, but you know what, maybe try this. Try this for now and we'll see if we can move on to this next. Or you need to take time off. Um, I'm kind of in a tight situation here. And so I just want you to understand this is where I'm coming from. I don't want to throw you into the deep end, but this is where I am now. If you could help in any way, great. If not, okay, thanks for, uh, like, I'm on, on, trying to be understanding here, but I want to know where you are so I know where I can, you know, maybe delegate the work to someone else without you feeling like I'm taking ownership away from you. And it's trying to come to that common understanding, communication, empathy, and then also adapting as a leader. So if, if, if a situation isn't going to work out, you're not going to say like, hey, that's that person's project. They need to do it. Hell or high water. I don't care if you're burnt out or tired. You're doing it. It's like, no, you need to adapt. If that person is no longer able to do the work, you need to find another solution. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it, this kind of parallels the, the story of the workplace more widely, doesn't it? As we've seen over the recent decades, and particularly the last sort of four or five years, the, the COVID years, where we had this sort of very top-down, autocratic kind of driven workplace, the sort of the production line thinking, that kind of stuff where people are resources and nothing more. It's a debate, isn't it, at the moment? But generally speaking, I think we've we've moved beyond that. Things are progressing now, and I think there is much more around purpose and people first and, and that kind of business. And I think there's a generational aspect to that. There's a COVID and great resignation implication to it. But also, I think it's just civilizations moving on a bit, isn't it? That's a very optimistic and hopeful thing to say, I know. But I do think, though, the mental health generally, we'll talk about it a bit later in the context of burnout, because in that context, in that setting of, of things getting more modern and an approach changing, mental health isn't quite the same stigma as it used to be in the workplace. It isn't quite the same stigma as it used to be. People are more open to talking about it in the public eye, as in saying that they're a, a workplace that helps people um, with their mental health and being more inclusive and um, having, let's say, employee assistance programs available. But when it comes down to it, they say they have those supports, but then they put other obstacles in place. Uh, one, for example, was there was one workplace that had an employee assistance program, but the only way to access it, even though it said it was 100% confidential and free and, uh, and available for all employees, the only way you could access it was by contacting the HR manager directly. And I flagged this and I was like, why don't you just take a notice up on the bulletin board so that anyone passing it, they can glance at it. They don't have to make it known to, like if people are going through all of these, like let's say, like burnout and stress and overwhelm, they're probably not telling their friends or their family. They're not going to tell their line manager. They're definitely not going to tell the senior HR manager that they feel stressed out in their work if they feel that it's going to affect their job. So why why don't we make it 100% confidential that the information is available to them and they can reach out at any time, get the counseling that they need and get back to work. Um, and they just made it so they put so many hurdles in place that they almost wanted to be like, yes, support is available as long as we can track the data. As like, that's not 100% confidentiality. And it, it, it was like, it was like, yes, we offered the service, but they had their own hidden agenda in the background. And um, so I think that's something that we need to step beyond as well. It's like, yes, we can track some metrics. I, I know some, some workplaces that track stress metrics. Uh, using stress monitors and, and, and measuring people's HRV, um, which is good to understand from a health perspective, but not to use it against your employees that, oh, your, your, your stress performance um, is this or your HRV is showing this, you're no longer competent for this role. So I, I, I think it's 
it's it's there is progress, but the motives in some workplaces are very um how to put this nicely, but they 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 they're they have ulterior motives when it comes to how they are tracking um how they are offering their mental health services and how they are trying to come across that understanding. Where it comes to mental health services and mental health support and trainings, I feel also that there is a lot more support for leadership and management than there is for, let's say, the staff on the line. And that because I've come across this a lot, especially when it comes to leadership and burnout trainings, it's like, oh, we, we have that for our, our top management, senior management, get all of these trainings. And then they ask, okay, well, what supports do you have in place for the other 90% of the company? And then they're like, oh, well, they, they haven't come looking for it. That's where you can like, draw a line and like, hmm, okay. Do, 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 do we maybe need to increase their awareness? Maybe they don't know what they're going through. Maybe if we start a conversation, they might talk about it a bit more. And they're like, oh, no, wait, it's only when they come looking for it that we provide them. It's a tricky situation, isn't it? Particularly where it's, it's part of the rewards package or perks or however you describe it. Um, I mean, certainly as an employee, when I was going through burnout, I didn't necessarily realise that's what it was at the time. But I would have been very nervous and sceptical, cyn- cynical even, about making use of that kind of support service when it was being paid for by my employer for many of the reasons that you say, because you never quite trust if they're paying for it, they own the data. So they're going to know that would have been my suspicion. I don't know whether that was fair or not, but (laughs) so there's that added complexity as well. Of Even if you're doing everything right and you're offering it and you're paying for that support, people might not take you up on it because they won't trust that their data isn't going to be used for some other ulterior motive as you say so yeah that is a difficult one um and then the awareness bit totally agree with that 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 that's something i think everyone should have at every level of the company because as i've just said i mean when i was going through it i only know that in hindsight from thinking about it and from conversations with people like yourself at the time i had no idea that's what it was i just thought i was a bit angry about stuff (laughs) so i think that awareness piece is really important for for helping people recognize what they're going through for leaders to understand what others might be going through as well. And then if you don't know what it is, you can't help, you can't solve. Yeah, exactly. And that was one of the reasons why I first started my podcast for Give Yourself Some Leeway. It was when I was going through my burnout and I was trying to look up resources, not many people were talking about it on social media. And not many, especially men, men weren't really talking about it, especially in podcasts or I couldn't find it really online. Because I found in some books they're saying, oh, the way women and men experience burnout is completely different. And that's understandable. We have different emotional intelligence. And um, and so it's like, okay, what, what do men do when they experience burnout? Is Where are the differences? Because there's a lot of women who've, who have written books and they've just said that men experience it differently. Um, what, what am I supposed to be looking out for? And they they just weren't talking about it. So then when I went through my experience, I said, well, I better document this so that maybe there's someone else out there who might hear this today and might resonate with what I have to say. And when I published, it, oh my gosh, the first few episodes I published, it was literally just like stop and and, and record like two or three seconds. And it was like, no, I took a breath and I took a breath and I need to go back and rewind and do it again. And then writing, writing, writing out all my thoughts in the script just so that I didn't offend anyone or maybe I didn't say the wrong thing because I didn't want anyone to think of, I wasn't, I wasn't blaming my workplace. It wasn't that I was like, oh, I had a big bad boss and he burnt me out. It was like, no, it was, it was none of that. It was, I wasn't aligned with my work anymore. I wasn't the same as I was 10 years ago. And because I wasn't aligned with that work, there was an imbalance. And that expend, expenditure of energy into something that's not reciprocate the same fulfillment meant that I was investing other time into other areas of my life. And then anything that was like a, a traumatic experience that I should have regulated, I immersed myself in more work, be that in my career and in side projects, side hustles. I always immersed myself in more work. That brought me out. I could not regulate my emotions anymore. And 
when I started expressing all of these feelings, and I was like, look, I, I, I did a kind of a, a warning at the beginning of the episode saying, this is going to be raw, this is going to be pretty uncomfortable, but I'm sharing it, might help someone today. 90% of the feedback I got was so negative, like really negative. They were like, you can't share that kind of thing on social media. You can't talk about your mental health. That's career suicide. How dare you? Who made you think that this is a good idea? It's, it's actually better if you just take it all down and just stop. And then I just asked myself, I was like, okay, I was like, these people are not comfortable with me talking about my mental health because they're not used to me talking about my mental health. They're used to me being high spirited all the time. And me showing vulnerability was making them feel vulnerable. And only by me bringing this up, it was bringing up the emotions in them. So I was told then, they were like, oh, we know you, Eugene. We know that you're high spirited and you're this psycho who gets up at 3 a.m. to go to the gym before starting at 6 a.m. a 12 hour shift at work. It's like, so whatever you do in your psychotic routine and whatever you did for recovery was probably just as crazy. It won't work for me. So they invalidated anything that I use in terms of burnout recovery because my approach must be crazy and it's definitely not going to relate to them. So it definitely won't work for them. And that was supposed to stop me talking about burnout. If anything, it just fueled me for more. I was like, okay, people are uncomfortable about this because no one else is talking about this. And they would rather sit in ignorance and not bring up these feelings than have someone talk about them. But they don't relate to what I have to say because they're like, oh, we know Eugene and his approach is probably going to be crazy. So I was like, is there anyone else out there who has ever experienced stress in the workplace or ever felt overwhelmed? Or maybe they've experienced burnout and actually recovered from that and gone on to other things in their life. So I just, you know, put out the put out my feelers and started looking for people. I was like, hey, do you have a story to share around burnout? Hit me up. Let's have a conversation and see where it goes. And now I'm nearly 100 conversations later. I'm like, okay, I'm not the only one out here. We don't all experience burnout the same way. And we don't always have the same approach. We have a similar human pattern as to how we recover from burnout. But we don't always use the exact same cookie cutter approach. We have similar fundamentals. Yeah, and I think that's true of any anything like this in this sort of kind of realm of humans isn't it like not not all of us are the same by any means everyone experiences everything differently and i think there's there's so many so much to learn from that simple fact in all sorts of things burnout leadership uh you know communication we could go on for hours probably just listing things where that's relevant um but i do think as well there's a big lesson that i've learned since, since i started my podcast journey and that is ignore the comments <laughs> Many people who've been doing it a lot longer than me give me that one piece of advice, so it must be it must be accurate. But I'm glad you carried on as well, I have to say. <laughs> one thing I do love is about the comments is like sometimes you'd be talking about anything and next thing the comment they go is like, Oh, your hair is like going this way, or you've one strand of hair that's uh, falling down and makes you look weird. I'm like, Oh, thanks for noticing and thanks for listening in. I hope something else sank in or planted a seed somewhere that will come up in the future other than this strand of hair that's falling down across my forehead. Uh, and, and, and it's like all those minor details. I'm like, okay, how, and how did seeing that strand of hair affect you today? <laughs> how, how did that show up in your life? Yeah. Yeah, I've not, not had any comments on my appearance yet, thankfully. But I, I guess that'd be too easy for most people. I have had quite a few of just like one word, swear word responses to things, which is fun. Um, it's like I someone find... who has Tourette's just sticks it out on, 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 on YouTube or something. It's like, yeah. I'll just say that word and see that in the comments. Yeah. I don't know. That's I think it, I assume it's just trolls. They're just trying to get a rise yeah. out. I'll just ignore it, delete it. Um, but yeah, every now and then you'll get someone who genuinely wants to debate an issue and they just have a different point of view to something I've said. Um, that's great. I welcome that. That's really, yeah, that's a, that's a dying art, I think, in modern society. So, yeah, I try not to. Try not to discourage that, shall we say. <laughs> it's nice having someone who even just plays the devil's advocate and just mm -hmm. wants to say the exact opposite of what you have to say. It's like, okay, let's have a conversation around that. Because maybe they're just trolling or being devil's advocate, but there could be someone genuinely feeling that way. It's like, okay, let's overcome that hurdle together. Let's see where this conversation goes. Yeah, definitely. Or they're, 
testing you or they just want to yeah. understand it better and that's the way they do it is by asking difficult questions all of which is fair enough i've been that person myself so it's all good <laughs> We talked about awareness a bit already, but I think one of the things that I've, I've always struggled with from both sides of that table, really, when, when I had it myself and when I knew others had it at work, is actually spotting it. I only knew it in hindsight again. So as leaders, what signs do you think we should be on the lookout for to help us identify burnout in ourselves, but also in others? As, as a leader, and, and try, try, especially when you have a team and you're trying to understand, okay, is my team feeling burnt out? And you're not going to see like if if you're like, oh, are you stressed out? You can just go to your team's like, are you are you feeling a little stressed today? Are you feeling a bit stressed? Maybe that's burnout. Maybe you have to do something about that. And it's like you can't have a direct approach like that as as a as a leader, because because it's such a taboo topic. You need to think of you need to you know take a step back and see. A lot of people don't want to don't want to talk about burnout because. Again, they don't want to be made feel weak and incompetent because I've experienced this in the past where I said I felt overwhelmed about something. This was even before I burnt out. It was just a big project. And I said, look, this is a lot for me to take on right now and don't feel like I can, I can do it. And straight up a manager was like, oh, uh, you're, you're not competent enough for this role, is it? You're, you're, you're not able to keep up. Uh, and, and, and rather than offering support, I was like, I was like, oh, um, you're, you're really putting me in the spot here. I actually don't know how to move forward. And rather than offering and saying like, okay, I can put you on with this person who's done it before and get you training with them because it was something I hadn't trained in. And they were straight to, you're incompetent. You should know this by now, by being on the job. You should have picked it up from someone else by now on your own initiative. If you haven't done so, you're, you're a failure. Uh, but that did not help in any way. And a lot, of, a lot of the time, leaders tend to, of course, you have a lot in your plate also, but they fail to recognize how is it affecting their team. As you show up as a leader, also affects your team. This, you have, if you have negative energy coming into the workplace, that will probably affect the team's going to cause resistance. Things to look out for if you think that a member in your team is burned out is if it gets to a stage where people are being a bit cynical or um, <laughs> and we, 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 we probably see that a lot here in the UK and Ireland is that people can be very cynical about what they do. Um, but it's, it's when it gets to a state where you're disengaged from the work as, as well. And where, where someone has previously been engaged or motivated, and it's like, okay, what, what's happened recently caused that disengagement? And you can't really approach someone and say, why are you so disengaged with your work lately? because you're putting them straight on the defensive. They're not going to open up about that. So as a leader, you need to create a safe and open environment so that people can feel that they can approach you, so that they can have those questions. Try and have uh, an open dialogue, maybe one-on-one, -on -one if you feel that it's a particular concern for some individuals in the team, and be like, look, how are you feeling? Try and be compassionate, try and validate their feelings. It's like. Uh, what's your experience with work lately? It can be a lot for some people lately, you know, think things are a bit uh, up in the air, um, things might seem a bit vague, we have a lot of projects going on at the moment. Um, what, what would you like to be working on? Let's discuss goals. Let's discuss, okay, is there something project that you're on that you find particularly challenging? Is it challenging that you feel you can't complete it or that you may need help with that? Or is it challenging that you want to move on to something else and we need to find someone else to fill in on that project? Okay, let, let, let's just have an open conversation and be like, look, nothing has to change. I just want to see where you're at. And if you need help, if you need support, then come to me and we'll arrange something. It's trying to have those open conversations. Um, right now, my leader is... Um, he is very open about, about these things. One of the things that uh, I really respect about him, and one of the reasons why I took my new role um, in uh, microbiology over here in Switzerland, is because he is so transparent about how he treats every team member. And he's like, look, I'm, I'm just going to be completely transparent with you. If you feel you can't do this project, let me know. 
is if you don't let me know, I won't be able to assign it to anyone else. And th that will that will lead to more resistance over time. And it's, it's worse if it goes on for longer and you tell me that, oh, I never finished a project because it got overwhelming six months ago, then to tell me, look, I'm having a bit of trouble with this. I don't think I'm going to meet the deadline. Could I get some help? Or are there resources available? I think it's, when it comes to leadership, I always come back to the first fundamental trait that I look for in a leader is communication. If a leader can't communicate with their team, build those relationships, then they're not a good leader. 100% agree with that. I, I think it's about what, what a leader's purpose and what their job is as well. And to me, that is you're creating the environment for success for other people to succeed. And so if, if you have that conversation that you've described where you, someone comes to you and says, look, I'm struggling. I, I can't, I don't think I can do this project, or at least not right now. And your response is, well, it's because you're incompetent. Do it anyway. That is terrible leadership. It's bad management as well. Like if someone's told you they're not capable of doing something and you tell them to do it anyway, what's the most likely outcome that you would expect from that? It's, it's not going to get done, is it? Or it's going to be f below quality standard or they're just going to fail entirely. And at that point, that's not their fault, is it? That's your fault as a leader for not doing something about that to create the environment for success. And I think the way you've described your current leader is the polar opposite of that. That's doing it the right way, isn't it? So if someone says to you, I can't do something, don't say, well, it's your problem. Say, okay, how can I help? What can I do about it? And, and I mean that in a genuine sense, not as the sarcastic kind of thing that you might expect from someone in, in the UK. <laughs> what can I do about it? You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> That's another thing I find funny as well, working on a continent where there's kind of cultural miscommunications, mm. where they don't understand certain turns of phrase. And sometimes, like, sarcasm is a completely foreign language over here in Switzerland. And so, so, like, I had to really dial down on the sarcasm and the, and, and being, and, and when, when I first started, because people would take you literally word for word, come back about 10 minutes later and say, was that irony? And, and, and I think I was like, oh, oh, they don't understand sarcasm here. It just makes me look like an idiot. And, and, and then going, going back, it's like, no, I have to say everything literally, everything has to be very literal and very, very clear. There's, there's no humor, no UK Irish humor here and a very, very different sense of humor. And, uh, so yeah, it was, it was about having the, the clear, having clear, concise, uh, communication. And I think that has helped me as well. So that when I do, if, if, if I ever return to working in UK and Ireland, that rather than having those, kind of, you know, those narky res responses and, and trying to be humorous in my communication. It's about being, no, I'm going to be, you know, pretty clear and concise about what I really mean. And a lot of people use sarcasm as a way of defending ourselves or using a bit of light humor so that, you know, we can put up that, that veil, put up that mask. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, when it comes to also approaching a leader, it can be hard to, for people to say, like, I can't do this. And I was like, or approaching a manager and trying to say, I don't know how I'm going to go about this. And rather than just shrugging their shoulders and being like, I feel helpless. It's about having a constructive solution or some, some kind of constructive question. It's, I don't know how I'm going to meet this deadline unless we try A, B or C. And coming to a leader with that, that you, you've actually come up with a constructive possibility as to how you're going to overcome this. Rather than saying, I can't meet this deadline, full stop. Then I don't think I'm going to meet this deadline unless I get some help or unless we increase the timeline or maybe we delegate more on this part of the project and maybe caught a little bit closer with the review. It, it all goes, I mean, we talked about the burnout and mental health generally being a stigma, but I think putting your hand up and saying you can't do something, even if it's nothing to do with those issues, it's just because you don't know how to do it. Then the stigma is that's to that as well, isn't there? And it's that whole, especially in a UK setting, I think we're, I don't know what it's like in, well, in Switzerland or, or on the continent. In the States, I suspect it's probably a lot worse than it is here, but there is that almost unspoken assumption, isn't there, that if you say you can't do something, it's because you're incompetent and you're going to lose your job now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but there, and there's no mention of training. As, yeah, and you say it's like, oh, I don't know how to. Um, for for me, when I first moved over to Switzerland, I was like, 
I've never driven a car on the other side of the road before. And then they were like, well, you're going to have to learn. So, and, and for me, I was like, I was like, okay, it's either going to be in the company car and we'll see where that goes. Or for me, for my own comfort and safety, I just said, I'll take a few private lessons. And so that I'll be comfortable because I know it's going to be part of my job. It's, it's a traveling role. And it was just something that it was, it was funny in a way that they're like, well, you're just going to have to find that out for yourself. Or you're going to have to just learn on the job rather than be like, okay, are we putting this person in, 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 in a dangerous situation? Maybe we should arrange for some way of them avoiding a possible accident. Or maybe we look at something that there are other examples of people who have been just thrown into a role and they're like, you know, you've been 20 years as a, as a, as a line technician or 20 years as a product builder. So let's make you manager of that team. And next thing is like, oh, uh, why are you not managing your team properly? Why are you not scheduling them to, to come in? They're scheduling their hours. I was like, I have no experience with this, no training with this. And it's like, what do you mean? You've been 20 years in this department. It's like, yes, I've been 20 years in this department in a different role. I was not trained for this management position. And then they're expected to learn on the job because they're supposed to be familiar with this area. Yeah. I mean, the company car one's a bit scary, actually, but because it, but, I mean, surely they'd be liable. But anyway. Yeah, the, the, the company care one, I, I, I just kind of took it as I was, like, I was like, okay, I can see where you're coming from. And, yeah. But I just took it out on myself. I was like, you know, I get a private lesson because, hey, if I want to go on holidays here and I want to, to take a trip across Switzerland, I'm going to have to be comfortable with the roads myself. So mm -hmm. I just took that on myself. I was like, you know what, that's, that, that, that's on me. If I already have my license. Having a license is part of the job, but they never asked which side of the road I want to drive on. So that was on me. I was, I was, I was like, no, I can, I can, I can take, I can take that one. But when it came to, let's say, um, soft skills training, and I tell mm -hmm. people to learn on the job without giving any opportunity for them to get that training, it's a lot harder to learn on the job, and you can ruin a lot of relationships and networking with other people by having picked up bad behaviors along the way. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I think. Trying to trying to say this without exaggerating horribly, but I I feel like that's the biggest problem in leadership in companies today, it, and it's compounded by the fact that the more people do it as they move up, it becomes self fulfilling, and so you're learning on the job from someone who's learned on the job, who's learned on the job, and so on and so on. And if that first person did it badly, or the second, third, or fourth person didn't quite take the lessons from someone who did it well, then you're just in this vicious cycle of bad leadership bad management practices and yet it's the norm it's normalized there's that word again um i mean it's the accidental manager problem isn't it and and there's i mean there's studies on this the cmi are, are pushing one at the moment where they've done they reckon 82 percent of managers are in the job without having any leadership and management training 82 i mean can you think of any other job where 82 percent of the people doing it have never been taught how to do it it, you know, an airline, like a, a plane pilot or a yeah. surgeon or yeah. a doctor. Like... <laughs> anyway, so that one really winds me up. And that's why we're here, of course, is to hopefully try and do something about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's even something similar I've come across as well. Even before I started the podcast, one of my friends reached out and he was telling me about how he had a bad experience with one of his managers. And I used it as an example in one of my episodes. Because and I kept kept it as vague as possible, kept it completely anonymous, uh, because he was working in Eastern Europe at the time, so it was about four thousand miles away. So I thought maybe it was just a cultural thing. And what happened with him was that uh, he was working on the project and he knew he couldn't meet the deadline. And he had he was so I he said, "Look, I'm working on project A, B, and C right now." Went to his manager and said, "I won't meet the deadline for project A if you expect me to work on project B and C." So either we increase the deadline for project A or you take me off project B and C for now so I can focus just on project A or you delegate someone else to help me finish project A. And the manager lost it, absolutely went red in the face and started swearing at him and everything and saying like, how dare you approach me with this? How can you not manage your time better? Are you saying that you, I have to take you off this project and give it to someone else and just completely like, took it to a whole other level? Rather than saying, okay, let's look at the options and see what we can do. 
And I was just gobsmacked when he told me. And I, I expressed, I was like, how dare a man just speak that way? How dare someone actually, uh, rather than look for a constructive solution, absolutely berate and, and, and have such a descending tone towards one of their own team. So as a result, he was completely, he just dropped complete ownership of the project and he was like, that's the way I'm going to be treated. Then I don't care about that project anymore. I'm just going to go onto LinkedIn or go onto Indeed and look for a new job. That was not productive at all. And when I brought up that story, I was approached by someone within my own company at the time. And they reported me to HR to say that I was talking about them. And I was like, okay. And next thing I was like, okay, let's see where this goes. And I was like, I definitely did not know about this. And I was like, yes, that was a conversation that they had with their manager only last year. And I was like, so are you telling me that someone in this company treated an employee like that? And straight up HR was like, that's not the conversation we're here to have. We're here about you talking about them on, on a podcast. And I was like, oh, I wasn't talking about them. But they obviously related to the experience because they were treated the same way. And my question was, was that the only employee who was treated that way here by that manager? Is that that manager's approach to everything? Did that employee only bring it up because they resonated with the story that I shared? And is that the way the manager has been trained to treat people? Or is that the way he's been trained by his superiors by learning on the job? So how deep does this go of a manager treating someone that way when they came looking for help and support? Because that's what the manager was there for so that they can delegate to someone else or provide resources to finish the project. And straight up, they were like, oh, no, that's not what we were trying to deal with here. We were just trying to deal with, see if you were talking about someone else behind their back. And uh, it was just completely just put, put to the sidelines. And I was like, okay, this is a much bigger issue than I thought. Something that I thought was an isolated project 4,000 miles away was actually right under my nose and in the same work environment. So I hope that this project or this example resonates with someone else. And hopefully they have, actually, no, I hope it doesn't resonate to the same level because I don't want it actually happening in other places. Or maybe it is happening where I don't know what I'm looking for anymore. Do I want people to resonate with this story because it's not something someone should go through? But if it is something that someone has gone through, I want them to make sure that that it's a, that maybe it's a systemic problem that we need to address on a, on a bigger level that, you know, it comes down to how we train our managers. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many things that we could unpack in that story, isn't there? But I mean, the shouty manager thing. I mean, first of all, that would sound like a really bad day for HR. I was going to have this problem, and oh, it was that. Oh, oh, this is a much bigger. We don't want to deal with this one. Yeah, you know, I can I can see the deer in the headlights right now. Yeah. <laughs> <eye. laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the shouty manager. I think everyone sadly has had that experience at least once in their career. I mean, I know I have, you probably have. Most people I talk to about leadership and management have had that experience at least once. So there's definitely a systemic, systemic problem. Where I'm less certain is when we get into trying to solve that and understand what, what the causes are. And I, I kind of think at the moment, anyway, I change my opinion on this regularly, but at the moment, I think there's a dual responsibility there. The lesser part of that sits on that individual manager accepting yes you know sometimes everyone has a bad day sometimes the stress of the job gets to them something going on outside of work you know any number of external factors that could have led them in that moment to just lose their temper and that's very human very understandable at the same time that doesn't diminish their responsibility for treating another person in that manner it's not acceptable in the workplace simple as that the bigger share of responsibility i think anyway is on the organization and the leadership of that organization that has allowed a culture to develop where that is seen as acceptable. And that, what's interesting as well about the story is that that person presumably didn't report the manager to HR. They reported you for talking about the story. So there's a cultural problem there as well, isn't there? <laughs> yes. Where they felt they, they didn't feel comfortable about reporting their line manager, but they did feel comfortable to report someone who did not work in the same department, who had no effect on where they will go in their career, if I was outed 
for, for some reason, or that I had no effect on their line manager, that it wouldn't be taken, taken up the line. So it was, for, for me, it was important that it did come to life because I was like, okay, is this what it takes for that person to raise a question? Then it's, it's up to, okay, it's, it's been raised to HR. Are they going to do something about that manager and how they're approaching their team? Or I think it just becomes a systemic problem. It's like if they if they don't see the issue the way that I see the issue, <laughs> it's like what can I do to change that? If yeah, they, do they see that as acceptable behavior? This is it. This is it. I, I think you know I've, I've said it many times. I've heard it said, but you know the, the culture of your organization is ultimately it's the sum of the worst behavior that you permit, and in, in things like that, I mean. There's no two ways about it. It's bullying. That's what that is. So if you're allowing that to happen, then you're sending a clear message. And ultimately, you're not going to hold on to your people. Certainly not the best people. They'll be gone like a shot because they can easily find another job somewhere else, probably for more pay and almost certainly for less stress and none of that nonsense. <laughs> exactly. And that's where people are made feel that they have this job insecurity, that they're so replaceable and so disposable. And next thing you see the people who've been working there for 10 or 20 years all leave. And next thing you're left with 50 new people who you need to train from scratch. And with that, we are hitting the pause button until next week. Thank you, Eugene, for an incredible first half of that conversation. Can't wait to pick it up again next Wednesday. Listener, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do consider leaving us a rating or a review. Or if you'd rather get in touch directly with me to share your feedback, you will find my LinkedIn profile in the episode description. So drop me a DM, let me know what you think. You'll find, of course, some links to learn more about Eugene in the episode description as well. Check out his website, reach out to him. As always, I encourage you to do that. Go and learn more things. Finally, if you are encountering related leadership challenges like burning out staff, imposter syndrome, low confidence, or you feel like you just don't know enough, you need to build your knowledge of leadership and management so you can be more effective in your role, then do come and join us. Join our online community of leaders, Integrity Leaders, Community Membership and Learning for new leaders or first-time founders. You can participate in live workshops and learning events, benefit from extra and exclusive content, and get early access to Leading with Integrity podcast episodes just like this one. So hear it before anyone else does. All within a supportive community environment, fully online and remote, no need to travel anywhere, full of leaders just like you. Right now, you can join for free for 60 days. We do a 60-day, two-month free trial, at least until the end of the summer. UK summer, that is, so early September 2024, and that's being generous with the definition of summer in this country as well. After that time, the membership structure will be changing, so act fast and don't miss that incredible opportunity. That's all from me today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening. I will talk to you again next week when Eugene is back for part two of this episode. And until then, be a leader, not a boss. Thank you.